Hello and thank you so much for coming by the channel today. I really appreciate it. My name is Susan. This channel is Road Reads and let's do a reading check-in today. So I have finished a few books since we last spoke and I'm going to start talking about uh, the most recent one I finished and uh, it was actually suggested and then seconded by two of you. And that book is the 1980 modern classic J.L. Carr's A Month in the Country. I have heard about this book, but I had never read it. It was not on any TBR I had, but it was suggested to me. I believe it was the I believe it was suggested in the comments of the video I did uh, talking about uh, A Court of Thorns and Roses. And I said, because that was just so not a Susan book. I just felt like I needed a Susan book, which is a quiet and yet poignant read. And this was a perfect recommendation. So thank you so much. Have you read A Month in the Country? I'm probably the last one to read it, right? In the world. Me, Susan, last one. Let me know in the comments if you have read it and what you thought about it. I thought it was amazing. Let's talk about the plot. So our main character, he's young, early 20s. The year is 1920 and it's summertime. And it's, so it's 1920, summertime, over in England. So we're talking about post-World War I, a war in which our main character had a very active role in and it has affected him with what was then termed shell shock. Life has been difficult post-war for him as it was for many others. And he he's from London. He he gets this job. So he is a professional. He is, I don't remember what the term is, if it gave us a term, but basically what his job is, he he is um, assigned to go to this church. It's a church out in the country, thus the title. And it has a, a wall, a mural art on the wall. Maybe it's even the ceiling. And he needs to uncover it because through the years it has been covered. And it, it's a very, it's meticulous work because you can't go too far. You have to get it just right. So, uh, I mean, there's quite a metaphor there, right? For um, someone who is going through all that he is going through. And here it is his job to uncover the things that have been hidden. And so what the story is about is him going there to do this work, which means so much to him, but it's really about these relationships that he forms while he is there. He goes from the state he arrives in, in this country town, to when he leaves, and then what that arc looks like. I do want to share a quote that I think will set the tone of this book for you. This is near the beginning. The marvelous thing was coming into this haven of calm water and for a season not having to worry my head with anything but uncovering their wall painting for them. And afterwards, perhaps I could make a new start, forget what the war and the rose with Vinny had done to me and begin where I'd left off. This is what I need, I thought, a new start. And afterwards, maybe I won't be a casualty anymore. Well, we live by hope. So I think that that sets the tone for this book. If you haven't read it and you enjoy literary fiction, this is a short novel, but oh so poignant, oh so moving. I gave it four plus stars. On any given day, it could have been a five star. That, who knows, that might get bumped up to a five star. I feel like this book is going to stay with me. The story for me was was that moving. Um, it was quietly emotional, which is just my kind of thing. I, I love that. And I love when it's told in a concentrated way. I mean, I, I like big books, right? I, some of my favorites are big books, but if I had to choose, I love short stories. I love novellas. I love short novels. I love it when you get to the end and you think, oh, but what about this and this and this and this? For some people, that's frustrating and that's why they don't like the shorter versions. For me, it's kind of awesome, right? Because then we're more participatory in the story. And I love it when they can just like 
you know, um, it's like they're sparring with you and then they punch you and then they just leave. They leave the ring and you're just, you're just left standing there like, what? What just happened? I love it when a book does that to me. Anyway, uh, so yes, I highly recommend it if you haven't read it, but if you have read it, let me know in the comments and let me know what you thought. I would love to hear from you. The book I finished right before that I read half of it on my Kindle and half of it via audiobook, both of which I got from uh, the library. And that is a work of nonfiction. It's a memoir by Maggie O'Farrell, so of Hamnet and a marriage portrait fame. And that is her memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am. And the subtitle, subtitle of that is 17 Brushes with Death. The title comes from, I wanted to be sure to share this with you, the title comes from a, a quote from Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, and it's near the end. It's virtually the last page, you know, somewhere on the last page of The Bell Jar, where it says, I took a deep breath and listened to the old brag of my heart. I am, I am, I am. So, um... Yes, so I've heard people talk about I am, I am, I am, but in true Susan fashion, I don't remember anything about what they said it was about. I mean, I remember it was brushes with death. I just remember people saying they liked it. I don't remember any details. Had I remembered what people actually said about this book, I went into it thinking this was gonna be comical. 17 brushes with death, right? It sounds too awful to be true. It is not comical. I'm not saying that she doesn't intersperse some humor here and there, but these are 17 real brushes with death. So if you take nothing out of this book review, no, this isn't a fun ride. She is so descriptive, so emotionally charged as she recalls these experiences through her life, some way back when, she's about my age, I think she's a year older than me, uh, some from childhood, some from young adulthood into current time. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's powerful. And I never talk about, or, or rarely, I can't think of a time where I've really talked about trigger warnings on this channel. And I do feel like, because this is nonfiction, I feel like I should say, hey, it's got some trigger warnings you might want to keep in mind. If if you've had similar experiences that she discusses in this book, which will include, I mean, some I doubt any of you have had. Uh, they seem sort of rare. But others you could have experienced. Um, there's certainly assault in here, but there's also miscarriage and infertility. And she had me crying. I was driving and I was crying with something that particularly um, resonated with me. And I wasn't expecting that. So I, I do, will throw that out there just because she writes so emotionally, so rawly. She's very open. She's very detailed, which I think do you really remember what someone was wearing back in 1989? Like, I just, how do you remember that things? I know those things. I know authors, writers have maybe, are more observant than, than me, than the average person. But some of these things were so detailed. And then I thought, well, maybe when you're doing memoir or autobiography, you fill in those types of things that may or may not have been true with the actual true events just to make it more well-rounded I don't know but she was very specific with things and if that was all from her memory wow um what a memory but um no the the actual events she talks about I'm sure were true I'm, I'm not questioning that at all and uh it was very powerful so well written I mean I was just astounded I gave it four plus stars again on any given day it could have been a five uh if so, if you like memoir and you're okay, you know, with um, these brushes with death, reading about it, uh, I say, I say pick it up. Then the book I finished before that, 
Is, it was a bit of a letdown. I was looking forward to it. It is this author's second book, I believe. I read his first book last year. Everyone in my family has killed someone. So this is Benjamin Stevenson, an Australian author. I loved Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. I read it last year via audiobook. He's an Australian author. So I loved listening to the book with a narrator with an Australian accent. I thought it really lent itself to the experience. And it was so tongue in cheek. He breaks that wall between uh, writer and reader, talking straight to us as the reader. It's a mystery thriller. And I really loved it, recommend it, especially recommend it on audio. But his book that was just released here in the US at least uh, recently was Everyone on This Train is a Suspect. And for me, uh, I'm not saying for everyone, but for me, it wasn't nearly as entertaining as the first book. I don't ever remember being bored with his first book. With this one, it was taking so long to get to the murder that I'm just like, oh my gosh, how long are we going to go before something happens? I hate using the word bored. I do, but I was bored. And then it did have a nice wrap up at the end that I thought was clever, uh, but not enough to... <laughs> really make up for the book. I gave it two plus stars. Um, again, take that as you will. Maybe check out some other reviews if you also were excited to read it. Have you read it yet? It did just come out. I got it on audiobook from my library and I liked the end. I mean, the end was very good, I thought. It's just getting to there felt like a long process. <laughs> so that's what I've read since we last spoke. And what am I currently reading? Okay. This is one of the things I love about reading is the spontaneity of it. So um, I was watching Kim at middle of the book March, as one does. And she had mentioned this in a prior video to that one, but she is listening to uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, so the first in the Lord of the Rings series on audiobook, oh, and I forget his name. I'll put his name here. But anyway, she loves this narrator, and this is a reread for her, and she, she really was talking up the audiobook on this. And I was, when I watched her video, I was in an RV campground uh, south of Savannah, Georgia, needing to do the rest of the drive home. And I already had an audio book, I already had an audio book picked out for that drive, but Kim was so darn persuasive. I had no plans on reading the, the Fellowship of the Ring anytime soon. And I, you know, after watching her video, I checked my library Libby app. It was available. I downloaded it with the narrator she loves so much. And that's what I listened to from um, south of Savannah all the way home. Okay, you all are going to be thinking, Susan, how can you be that ignorant? Now, keep in mind, I've never watched the movies. And somehow I missed actual uh, plot descriptions from other booktubers when they've talked about this book. But I didn't realize that the Fellowship of the Ring was so Hobbit-centric. Because when I, I haven't watched the movies, but I've seen like, you know, little bits here and there on television. And I all I feel like it's other creatures that they're showing, like the, the elves or, or whatever. And so I start the Fellowship of the Ring and I'm hours into it thinking, what an idiot, Susan, this is all about the Hobbits. Like, I mean, we start with Bilbo again. I had no idea. I, I was that ignorant. I just thought it was not as connected to The Hobbit as it is. And so I am loving it. Uh, I, you know, I read The Hobbit for the first time last year. I just fell in love with Bilbo Baggins. I fell in love with The Shire. I have so much in common with Hobbits. I, I would love to live in The Shire. I do not have hairy feet, but and I, I'm not, I'm kind of tall, but other than that, like, there are so many similarities. Um, I, I just love listening to that. And with The Hobbit, even though I'm not really into like adventure books, <laughs> it was just so charming that, and there was enough about Bilbo and, and you know, the charm of all that, that that's why I five-starred The Hobbit, not because of the 
fantasy aspect and the, you know, the the war and the dragon. I don't care about that. But I love the charm of this, um, you know, Tolkien creation. And I did not know that that's what I was going to get more of. So I would have started this shortly after finishing The Hobbit last year had I known that. Again, you're all like, Susan, how did you not know that? I don't know. I'm amazingly skilled at at missing things everyone else knows about. So I am listening to that. I'm about 50% through with the audiobook and really enjoying it. And then, uh, okay, so <clears throat> uh, let's switch to television really quickly because another thing I've been obsessed with lately and went down a rabbit hole with is um, Hulu's uh, feud. This, so this is season two of The Feud, and it centers around Truman Capote and his swans. And I started watching that a few weeks ago, and wow, I was in it. I was in it from the beginning, and then I started like researching on YouTube more about Capote and all of this stuff. I think it's, I think it's Capote that I find so intriguing, and these relationships he's formed because. I'm not into the whole high society thing. Um, you know, these women who are rich beyond compare and live in that kind of lifestyle. I don't really care about that. They're all fashion icons. I really don't care about that. So why I am so into this TV series, I, I don't know, other than it has to be Capote and finding out more about him. I have of course read In Cold Blood by him. I'm due for a reread of that. I read Breakfast from, um, Breakfast at Tiffany's from him. Uh, so, and I, I remember him as a kid. Like, I remember him being on TV. So anyway, totally into the TV show, right? On Hulu. I knew the Hulu series was based on a book, and it's a book by Lawrence Lehmer called Capote's Women, A True Story of Love, Betrayal, and a Swan Song for an Era. So I got the Kindle version of it. It was like $2 and some odd cents. Uh, downloaded it, started reading it. I wasn't really enjoying it. <laughs> so then I, I knew there was a historical fiction book that came out several years ago because I, a friend had read it and recommended it to me. I'm not a big historical fiction person. And that's Melanie Benjamin's uh, The Swans of Fifth Avenue, talking about the same thing, Capote and his swans, you know, these socialite women and um, what their relationship was like. And then especially about what their breakup <laughs> was like. And so I started reading that last night. Again, got it from the library. I, I made it like 24% through last night and just thought, nah. I just, I'd rather read the nonfiction version than read the historical fiction version. Even though I'm not loving the nonfiction version by Lemur, maybe it'll get better. I just, I'll give it a bit more time before I decide if I'm going to DNF it or not. Regardless, I'm obsessed with the Hulu series. <laughs> Let me know in the comments, are you watching the Hulu series? Have you read Melanie Benjamin's um, The Swans of Fifth Avenue? Or have you read Lemur's book? I need to rewatch the movie. I watched the Capote movie years ago. Um, where he and Harper Lee go out to Kansas, um, you know, as he's writing In Cold Blood and he's doing all that investigative work. I really need to rewatch that. That that would be a good one. Um, what else? Oh, I have an audio, another audio book going of um, a Perot book, Evil Under the Sun. And this is from 1941. I'll probably finish that today or tomorrow. So that'll be coming up in a review. The weird thing is, so I've talked about this before on my channel. When I picture Perot in my mind, I see David Suchet. He is the only Perot I think should ever be. He's just so perfect. Well, he's narrating this audiobook, but I am not enjoying his narration half as much as I enjoy the Hugh Fraser trans uh, narrations of Perot books. Isn't that weird? Like I only want David Suchet as my Perot when I am looking at a screen, but apparently I only want Hugh Fraser if I'm listening to an audiobook of a Perot book. Anyway, uh, so uh, yes, that will be done soon. And I think, 
I think that's uh, that catches everything up. So let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. I would love to hear from you. If you hung out with me on my two previous videos, which were a little different because uh, one of them wasn't bookish at all. I did a camper van tour while I was set up in a campground on Sanibel Island in Florida. And then I did a review of, of Gift from the Sea from Anne Morrow Lindbergh. Speaking of Melanie Benjamin, who wrote The Swans of Fifth Avenue, she wrote a, a same kind of book, a historical fiction book on the Lindberghs. And that's called The Aviator's Wife. And I read that several years ago for a real life book club I was in. It was okay. Again, that's just not really my preferred way. I prefer my history straight up rather than in a fiction, um, with a fiction slant. But you'll learn more about the Lindberghs through that book if you're wanting to. Um, because so many of the biographies on Charles Lindbergh, like the Berg biography, which is the most famous one, was before we found out Lindbergh had three secret families over in Europe. <laughs> so it kind of takes away, like part of me wants to read the Berg biography on Charles Lindbergh, but knowing that that aspect wasn't even known to the world yet. And it's very likely Anmara Lindbergh had no idea either because she passed before this information became known. Could she have known it and just kept it to herself? I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, I just put that out there that The Aviator's Wife is a historical fiction novel that has come out since uh, we found out more about Lindbergh. <laughs> and that might be of some interest to some of you if you really like Gift from the Sea and you enjoy historical fiction, then maybe read The Aviator's Wife. So uh, I think we'll leave it there for today. I would love to hear from you in the comments. And if this was your kind of video, if you enjoyed it and could give me a thumbs up, that would be great. And I will see you again very soon. Bye.